welcome and welcome and so good to see you all in this collective space where we are unapologetically centering Black feminist healing arts. I am Dr. Rila Violet Botts Ward. For those of you all who may not know me, I am honored to be the lecturer and instructor for this course. So this is Black Feminist Healing Arts. This is a community course that is made possible by UCSF Repair that is housed at the University of California, San Francisco in the Medical Anthropology Department. We have a very exciting panel today. We've been in our panel series, learning from so many beautiful, amazing, dynamic Black women, healers and practitioners. And this is our sixth of our seven panel series. And I'm honored to be joined by my sister homegirl healers who I will get to introduce to you all shortly. Before I do, I want to invite us into image descriptions, which is an opportunity to allow this space to be more accessible for folks. So with that, when we introduce ourselves, our name, our pronoun, I'm Re, she, her pronouns, and we also introduce our image descriptions. So y'all are used to me with my fro, sometimes a head wrap. Well, a black girl got some braids, honey. I got some chunky braids today. I did not have time to lay the baby hair, so the baby hairs is a little fuzzy and swirling and, you know, doing what they do naturally without no gel. And, you know, the new growth is starting to come in, so it's a little new growth at the roots of the braids. And I got pink and purple on the ends. Shout out to our good sis Blue, who also got some pink hair on the screen today. I have on a black turtleneck with my Sankofa tattoo out. I have on blue plastic-ish circle shape frame glasses, brown lip liner, brown lip gloss, and some gold shell shape earrings. And for those of you all who are not familiar with me, I am a light brown skinned Black woman, and my background is my books to my left and some curtains. So yes, that is me. And before we all the way dive in, I just want to invite our panelists to just real quick, just say your name, say where are you calling in from, and give us your image description, just so the folks could see how fly you looking on screen. And then we'll dive in uh, shortly to our panel. So I'll invite Reverend Esty first and then Blue. Hello, everyone. Hello, hello, hello. I am Reverend Eolosha Esty Nina Dillard. I am so excited to be here. I am a, a practitioner and an academic um, and a spiritualist, so I wear many hats, but we will get into that. My image description, my, my pronouns are she, her, hers. I am a brown-skinned woman who loves the color in the head, so I have some blonde going on right now. A little blonde, little blonde TWA, teeny weeny afro um, <laughs> with some cowrie shell, dangly earrings and some sacred beaded necklaces and a bright green dress, giving y'all some shoulder action since we trying to get in the summer a little bit. You know, just a... Come on, shoulders, we see you. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm in my office, so my background is blurred because it's nothing but books. And <laughs> it's not cute at all. Books. That's cute. Shelves. You cute. You Love cute. The knowledge. Shelves and dry erase boards is what's behind me. <laughs> Love it. What's up, y'all? Blue Nile here, Nicole Yanakopoulos. I go by Blue Nile, and I'm going to just jump into the image description because that's what we're doing. Got a little Afro popping. You know, I'm going to the rose gold. I'm on rose quartz here. I have some Nefertiti on, calling on my ancestors, bringing in the ancestors. I have my sacred prayer beads that I made that I always wear to remind myself of my Veda, which is Sanskrit for wisdom. Um, and I got my New York shirt on because I'm from the New York. I live in LA, born in Boston, then moved to New York. 
And yeah, I'm vibing, I'm here, I'm channeling spirit and I'm here for the ancestors calling in love, like healing medicine, honoring the land that we're on, just representing for all of my ancestors from this lifetime and all of the others. Ashe, thank you so much, Blue. Thank you so much, Esty. I'm so hyped to get into this panel. Um, before I do, just a few more announcements. So Adana, who is our community coordinator, who holds it down for all things logistics with this course, uh, we'll be dropping some information in the chat for y'all to give you more insight on what this course is, what this experience is, how you can stay tapped in with us, and also how you can tap into some additional healing resources should you need more support after this space. She'll also be dropping our full land acknowledgement, but I do want to acknowledge the Ohlone folks who are the stewards of this land that UCSF sits on and pay honor, homage, and gratitude to those ancestors as well. So we going to get into it. Is y'all ready? Is y'all ready to dive into this discourse on not just Reiki, right? Because we're going to be talking about Reiki, but we also going to be talking about what does it mean to be radical, Black, queer, spiritual, ancestrally led Reiki practitioners and healers who do a lot of things around supporting our folks with their healing. So I just want to make sure y'all ready. I want to invite us to take a breath in, like a ready breath, like I'm preparing myself for this heat. Okay. And release. All right. So Esty Dillard is a spiritualist, scholar, ancestral storyteller, queer sexologist, and Reiki practitioner. And Blue Nile is a musical artist, actor, poet, author, filmmaker, and motivational speaker, also a Reiki master and spiritual empowerment coach. And so my first question is like, what is Reiki? Because some folks know, but some folks are not so familiar. And so Blue, I would love for you to kind of tell us what Reiki is and then invite us into uh, some embodied practice um, as folks consent and feel comfortable. I would love to. I just want to say hello and welcome and thank you so much for that, you know, Reiki is a universal divine life force energy. You know, they could say that it's Reiki is Japanese technique, but Jesus was laying hands, you know, it was, it came from Lemuria. It came from previous lifetimes. It's a remembered medicine and it's laying hands on. It's advancing the life force energy, the chi, which flows through us. And I know y'all in school, so you get that scientific knowledge of the energetic field that we all have. So you can literally put your hands together, start rubbing them. Okay. And I'm going to guide y'all into something. Um, real quick to so you can experience and if you say yes to receive inhale through your nose and exhale through your mouth breathe down deep into your first energy center which is in your first your sacral between your hips your first root chakra right below your sacral chakra breathing into your belly expanding your belly and releasing the breath helps the energy flow. Inhale, I'm calling on the ancestors of love, light healing medicine, channeling the divine universe, channeling them from the grand central suns, unconditional white, white, golden light, imagining and coming down to our planet from all the suns in all directions. Love, light, and medicine processing through you, 365 degrees all around you, within you, through you. The breath helps the energy flow, so please keep breathing and just say yes. I'm sending some long distance. There's symbols that I have drawn on my hands and in the air, and it's in the intention, in, in the intention, just to wake ourselves up. Honestly, we are all healers, especially as women of color. I'm just keeping real black women. We really have the power within us already. So if we tap into it and awaken that knowledge and give the permission for ourselves to really truly be a conduit, be a channel of that divine universal love and light. But the key is the yes, the acceptance, the opening up. Now breathe into your heart chakra. Breathe into your heart. Put your hand on your heart. Say hello to your heart. Say hello to yourself. Come home to yourself. 
and just receive that quick little like one minute of little flow that I've sent you. If you said yes, then you hailed it. If you, if you, you know, and you're like, what is this? You know, it's something for you to learn, you know, it's something for us all to learn. And I'm honored to be a conduit of it, a channel of it, you know, and the word Reiki is made of um, two Japanese words, Rei, which means God's wisdom, higher power, spirit. This is, I'm a spiritualist, not a religious, although I've studied a lot of religions. Love is my religion. I'm also queer. Chi, ki, life force energy. We can't deny neuroscience and neuroplasticity. We have an energetic field that goes about six feet. It could 10 feet, depending on your life energy force. People get sick when they have low life energy. So Reiki is a powerful force and it's a powerful, and I'm a powerful channel, a conduit. And through the breath and through the intention and the willingness to accept, saying yes, defining and opening up your, your, your receptivity, the ability to receive love, because it's divine, unconditional love. And I'll, say, I'll I'll leave it there because I went on a tangent. I don't know if I went over time or whatever, but you know what I'm saying? It's a little introduction to what Reiki is. <laughs> Ashe, thank you so much, Blue. And I want to invite you, Esty, to just share a little bit about like what is Reiki. And if you want to, you know, guide us through or tell us about how you guide folks through Reiki. Yeah, I'll be... Um taking us in at the end i want to watch our um time i want to add to what blue has already said in in an excellent way um that lareki is light we all carry a capacity for light that is um a key component it's like our fingerprints our spiritual fingerprints if we think about it that way um that every created being has a capacity for so right like i can put reiki i can activate reiki in my dog um because all created beings carry that light and so as reiki practitioners we have been trained and you'll hear me say that a lot because um while I love the socials, everybody on IG ain't trained. <laughs> so train, <laughs> Blue and I are trained practitioners that have, have mastered how to harness that energy in a way that um, that 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 the force of that energy can flow through you for a particular purpose and intention to achieve an expected end. Um, so that's kind of a quick um, summation. I, and I'm and I'm being short now because I like to be long winded. So I'm trying to uh, make sure we get through the. I appreciate y'all, and I'm. I appreciate you so much talking about Reiki as light, Reiki as divine life force energy. And I'm just wondering if y'all could tell us a little more about how you came into Reiki, who you are, kind of like what your healing modalities are and how Reiki became a healing modality that felt in alignment with you as a healer. Absolutely. I would love to. Shall I start? Um, I definitely am so grateful to be here in this space and welcome everybody. And I'm just so honored because it is my medicine. You know, I, from near death experienced, I was ex, I've always been a psychic intuitive and a highly sensitive empath. So I like to say recovered empath is one of my teachers, Miriam Huston. I want to say her name because she's amazing. And, um, I learned, I try to be recovered, but let's be real, like with life and being a black woman, being queer, being a mother, um, it's not always, I'm not, I don't have the capacity to be alone and doing eight hours of spiritual work no more, <laughs> which I was when I was alone, I could do that. So being born into a lot of things, I healed from a lot of sexual trauma and healed from just trigger warnings. I'm sorry, I don't want to trigger anybody. I healed my life through my initiations by meeting my teachers. I didn't take any medicine. They try to prescribe me medicine. I, I'm sober also, six years, no drugs and alcohol. I would drink and in, in, in over feelings and stuff. And then I realized that was an issue and I never went to rehab or nothing. I just discovered, I, mo I moved 3000 miles away to save my life from New York, from Boston to New York, and then ended up in LA. Soon as I landed on this land, this particular land, I was able to hear the medicine when people would come to me, literally on music video sets, I'd be shooting videos. Native American man came up to me and was like, can you wanna to come to the ceremony? I started studying with the Native American chief and the tribe and doing peyote ceremonies in the, in the tent, praying and chanting. And then I met my Reiki teachers and I met more psychic and like just channelers and mediums to enhance my clairs and silence the voices because I was just taking in everything. So I learned my tools. I learned I wasn't sick. It, it, I was just highly, highly 
were all highly gifted. Mine were just coming on very quickly. I could read, I can see auras. I was seeing, you know, spirits and it was overwhelming. So I was trying to numb out. So thank God that I got sober and I had the willingness to do that. And then Reiki healed my life and I healed myself first. You know, Reiki level one is to heal yourself, right? Like, I thank you, Esty, for saying that because there's a lot of people out there doing a weekend vibe of getting a Reiki certification. And that nah, son, like that's 10,000 hours makes a master. Okay, honey pie. Like I have my elders. I have, I have just like, I have the reverence, first of all, living and not living that I'm a student of this for life, mm. for life. Okay. I am channeling the ancestors. I am channeling my ancestors of love, light and medicine. Let me be clear, love, light and healing medicine and, and blessing the guides that are not, you know, but for me, it was healing myself then healing my dog and my friends and my partners. And then level three is when you can make other people masters, right? But now that I've done hours and hours and hours of it, did I honestly just be willing to turn it into something that I can share with others? Because God told me, goddess spirit was like, please, the world needs healing. We need healing. I teach yoga. I teach breath work. I teach all that. So it was like a journey of all those things. Yoga helped me open my heart chakras first where I started studying quantum physics. I saw something like what the bleep do we know was incredible. Joe Dispenza, I studied him. He's, I worked with, like, I love Joe Dispenza, incredible neuroscientist. And I started learning about the brain and learning how I can change my brain with meditation. So I learned how to meditate first and I was, it became a deep, deep, deep meditation. You know what I'm saying? And that was the beginning of learning about this energy work and what is energy and this energetic field. And why am I attracting this energy? I'm an empath. Why am I attracting that narcissist? You know what I'm saying? Am I a narcissist? No, not at all. But guess what? I'm attracting what they're thinking of me. So learning all that, the way I'm thinking about myself, the way they're thinking, uh, the, the way I'm thinking about myself, if I don't love myself, if I'm thinking I'm a piece of, you know, whatever, there, and this person coming along treating me like crap because I'm, I'm not loving myself enough. So I learned that I get to open up my heart more and receive. And I just studied the energy centers and Cindy Dale. And like, there's so many teachers that I have that I continue. It's a limitless knowledge. I'm a student for life. I don't even like calling myself a master because I'm like, I want to be a student forever. I want to learn forever, but I am a teacher and I am a master of a lot of things. I'm an expert and, you know, but I'm humble because I understand that this is about goddess. This is about spirit. This is about the universe, y'all. And you know what I'm saying? So that's a little bit of it, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, blue be going, okay? I swing that mic to blue, blue like, listen, I got five Baby, do you, you hear me? This. I had to lean in. I'm like, I need a cocktail. I know this class, but I'm all in the camera like, I love me some blue. I love you. <laughs> yeah, so I'm going to jump in. Um, so for me, uh, much like Blue, I, which I think can often be our stories, A, as, as women, A, as powerful people, as people who have the path in this world to work with other people, to be in service to spirits, to be in service to other folks. I found myself very much so sick and unwell and unhealed um, as a younger person. So um, Reiki found me. <laughs> um, Reiki found me in a place where I couldn't receive anything else. I'm a black girl from Macon, Georgia. So I'm a church girl, you know, so I'd be the first one um, when I was in my early 20s to, uh, you know, bind up anything I thought was, <laughs> was not Jesus, you know. And um, I just found myself deeply, deeply, deeply depressed. And uh, that was compiled on top of many different, many different ailments and many different ways that my healing was demonstrating to, to my spirit, to my mind and to my body that it needed my attention. And so um, when I was really trying to get my life into a different place and find myself functioning again, um, I have a, a back injury from when I was a child and an uh, elder mentor of mine um, is a Reiki master. And um, and just said, can I can I lay hands for you? Is it okay if I send you some energy? And that was the place that I could receive it to understand. Okay, I know what laying hands is. This is a person I trust. This is a person I love. And she offered that to me. And then being, being who I am, I was like, what's that? I feel that. Wait a minute. Why is it going all over me? What's going on? Um, and so it was it was an opportunity for me to learn, for me to talk, for me to be in conversation. Um, and so it opened my eyes to the way that there are many different modalities that we really harness the divine source for our own healing, for our movement, 
movement for ourselves, for our communities, for the good of folk, for the good of Black folk, for the good of people of color, for the good of Indigenous folk, for the good of folks' evolution and elevation. And so for me, my modalities are diverse. I am an Eolosha, which means that I am a priest in the West African Orisha tradition. Um, I am also a reverend, so I still work actively um, in the Christian tradition. I also am trained in, in ancestral practices of the new African traditions, in addition to being an energy worker and a healer and a ritualist and a sexologist. Okay, y'all see, I tried to warn y'all about the power that we was about to be blessed with. So just for context, y'all, Reverend Esty is, be preaching every Sunday at the church and be bringing all these radical, Black, queer, feminist, ancestral practices to the Black church every Sunday. So I needed to just, you know, give y'all some context. And I also just want to honor like that Reiki, again, is one of many practices. And this course is all about integrative health and healing, thinking about all the different holistic healing modalities and how they operate and merge together. And Blue and I actually met through 12 Step and recovery programs through uh, the Adult Children of Alcoholics and Dysfunctional Families ACA program. And so I named that because Blue, for you, it's the energy work and the yoga and the Reiki and the music and the poetry alongside your 12 Step recovery. And I'm wondering if you can speak to us a little bit about like what your 12 step recovery journey has looked like through ACA, but also through the other programs. And I also want to invite you to share some from your wonderful, magnificent book. And if you could also drop the link in the chat so we can know where to get it, because I know that your book also talks some about your recovery journey. Yes. Thank you, sis. Sashe. Um, Ooh, so many things. I'm also trying to drop um, a Reiki healing workbook, but for some reason I can't drop it in the chat. I just texted to you, Ree, um, which is a free workbook I want to give to y'all. Breaks it down. And for me, recovery honestly had to come first because my dad died of addiction. You know, my mom's a living addict. I was about to say thriving. I wish. Um, I have a project called Thrive and my book is called Trauma Thriver. And that's me. I put my little baby girl, my inner child, that was my gift to her, man, because um, I had to really heal and get, get sober in order for the healing to stick, okay? Because drinking, alcohol, alcohol, get to the root of the words. I'm a wordsmith. I'm a writer. I love words, and I'm sure y'all are too. I It's the, 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 the Arabic. It's body-eating spirit, okay? So alcohol is a body-eating spirit. I blacked out because I'm a channel. I'm a channeler. So like, be careful what you're channeling, okay? Because I had to really get myself clear of drugs and alcohol so that I can only channel light because I would black out and say horrible things, end up saying, you know, doing things that I regretted. And I'm like, this is not how I want to live. So I chose to walk into the step to the room. Well, actually a therapist, I, I went to therapy, did all the therapy, you know what I'm saying? My dad died. It really sent me to therapy because I, I wanted to work on myself and the therapist suggested 12 steps. <laughs> so of course, I went to Al-Anon first because that's for the family of, of dysfunctionals. But then I ended up in AA. And then through AA, I was able to find ACA, which is the graduation program because it's all of the childhood wounds. It's all of the things and all of the dysfunctional families, the mother-father wound, which I'm learning with all my somatic healing and all of the work that I do with all of my teachers. And um, the, I'm going to read from Re Recovery Transformation in this book. I will put it in the chat. But what I learned, you know, is like the taproot. When I do soul retrieval, shamanic soul retrieval, right? We're going back to each year of my life. I send Reiki to each year of my life. So this little girl, I'm sending her light and I'm calling back the energy for her. And I'm talking, this is master energetics now when I'm doing severe like energy work, like and clearing and calling back like samurai, like it's, it's, it's spiritual. I don't want to say warfare anymore, but it is spiritual, sacred healing. Okay. Spiritual, sacred healing. And I'm honored that I get to do that. And I was awoken and I found teachers that I do it. So I'm going to read, I just opened up to this one, you know, it's called choices. Okay. And we'll see because I'm letting God, or should I do honestly, 
I'm going to do uh, the eye of the beholder. I got so many good ones, y'all. I'm like, how do I choose which one to hear? We'll do the eye of the beholder because the recovery section is deep. And then I have a radical story section. Okay. The eye of the beholder. Behold me to grow older. Help me to open my truth. The magnifying glass, the lawyer. My mind is the beholder. My mind is the prosecutor. Prosecute the pain, mangled in distortion, deception confused as perceptions, acid tears. I cried for my sister's abortions. My mind can be handicapped, self-loathing, highly empath, twisted addiction. Save me from the unwanted impact of affliction. I believe in you, higher power. Introduce me to sanity. Free me from the shackles of self-crucifixion. Tell the truth that creeps within. Too scared to be honest. I didn't know my worth. Hard to accept as truth, looking within. Why do I seek validation from you? Open the windows to my soul. Slam shut so long ago. Worrying, worrying, obsession in my mind. Thoughts paralyzing my feet. Numb it all with wine. Hopeless victim, a quiet terror inside, naked in the acid rain, too scared to be alive. Don't forget to breathe. Inhale the healing light. I see my beauty clearer. I find my tribe in fight. The eye of the beholder, a new pair of glasses, no longer carrying the world on my shoulders. And that's that one, y'all. The Eye of the Beholder from Trauma Thriver. There's a lot of good ones in here. This is all my experience, my, my mess to my message. So it starts from, I'm sorry, trigger warnings. I do say things. I'm very radically honest. And I just want y'all to know, you know, like, and I'm here for you. I'm gonna put my info in there if anybody wants to reach out. But yeah, what y'all think of that? What y'all think of that? Shay, thank you so much, Blue. And I appreciate you and your trigger warnings and your honesty and your vulnerability. And just want to name um, Adana is putting in the chat uh, a resource guide for folks who are looking for more support. If you need more support after this call, we are sharing openly, honestly, vulnerably about our lives and our trauma. And that can get heavy. And we want to make sure folks have what y'all need to feel held. So, Make sure you're looking at the chat, clicking that link uh, to get that support. And one of the many resources we have is an overview of the 12-step program. So if folks are interested in that as well, um, thank you, Blue. And thank you so much for your book and your words and your power and your truth. Um, I'm so inspired by you and the way that you send love and light to your whole self and all of your inner family members, your inner teenager, your inner child, and just how you honor your fullness. And we've talked a lot about that as integrative healing, right? When we in the medical field talk about integrative health care, like this is integrative health care because it's integration, right? We're integrating all of ourselves and we're integrating all of the healing modalities that resonate with our spirit to help us get well. So thank you, sis. And Essie, I would love to hear more from you about the work that you've been doing around like radical erotic embodiment as a sexologist and how also you understand this radical work you're doing within the Black church as a queer Black woman in the South. Um, I know I have a lot of spiritual trauma. I experienced a lot of religious abuse coming up. And so doing this sort of like radical embodied ancestral work, uh, it came with a lot of shame and fear because I felt like this isn't how I grew up. And I grew up learning that this, like how you said, it ain't sanctified. It ain't holy. It got to be bond in the name of Jesus because it's out of alignment with what is good, what is sacred, what is holy. And so I'm just wondering if you could speak more to kind of like what that radical work looks and feels like and how you've managed to honor all the ways that your spirituality shows up growing up in the ways that we did you know what I'm saying in the church that didn't always honor and affirm that 
Right, right, right. And it didn't. I think um, for me, it really is a full circle story, right? So I grew up in the deep South, very, very, very conservative. I grew up in an environment where you couldn't wear pants, where women couldn't touch certain sacred objects, where women were not allowed to preach or even go in the pulpit. Um, and so for me as a person who was always who I am, I was taught that my gifts needed to support a man or that my gifts needed to be relegated to certain spaces that were not ones of power, ones of privilege, ones where I could be centered, right? And so I think in alignment with this conversation about energetic work, I um, I got the gift really because of that, that I got access to where the black women were doing spirit work. Because the truth is we're harnessing this kind of energetic legacy um, that really exists already in our body. So for me, working with Reiki and other energetic modalities is a way that I harness my ancestral wisdom. It is a way that I do ancestral work. It is a way that I connect intentionally with the bodies of Black women, with um, Black women's self-love, self-worth, with body positivity, with um, sexual autonomy, with um, clearing, you know what I mean, the energy centers that we as Black women can hold for one another, and also the ancestral trauma around those erotic and embodied spaces. Um, if we think about even um, holding our memory to, to how Black women perform in church. We move in these very embodied ways, right? And we learn to respect and honor that. We learn to give it space. We learn to step back, right? And to, and to allow spirit to do what it's doing um, in our bodies and, and, and energetic modalities allow us to harness that power for healing and to make space for that healing work to clear um, and to activate um, more power. So for me, initially, I found myself as a child feeling very stifled, right? Because I was trying to make sense of how to process what I was experiencing with, with, without the space to really navigate it. And then in young adulthood, I thought I had a grasp on it and I had done a good job of suppressing it. And for me, um, the trauma that, that unleashed, um, all of that was that my father transitioned. My father died when I was in my early 20s unexpectedly, and I was very close to my dad. And that level of pain um, was more than I knew to articulate in any way, but um, for my life to shut down. And in doing that, I had to find myself rebuilding and all of these um, gifts and all these needs and all of these healing needs kind of kind of reveal themselves. And so in that process, I found other traditions. I, I found other practice. I found Reiki. And I found myself having to make sense of my sex life. I found myself having to reconcile what I had been taught um, because I was living that strictly, right? But it was more of a, um, <laughs> it was more of a, it was, it was more of a detached obedience than it was an embodied truth. Um, and so in that process, I found myself being initiated in African traditional religion, but in that experience, my ancestors saying, it's not for you to leave the church, right? That we have ancestral practices that are in that tradition also. And part of your destiny is to reclaim those practices and to continue to carry on that lineage. Now, I don't think that's everybody's path, right? But that was what it taught me is that all of our paths is not to deny or dismiss or compartmentalize any of the parts of ourselves or any of the ways that our ancestors have been able to work and to use their ashe and to use their power, but instead to locate our destiny in the lineage of that and how we live into that destiny and to do that work in those places, whether it's trendy or not, you know? And for me, sexuality was a huge part of that. Um, part of that awakening for me was being 27 and realizing that I was queer, you know, because I had to say, okay, what is this really, where's my truth really in all of this. Um, so that's that's my concise version. I'm happy to give a longer version. You asked me to read a piece. I am going to do that. Uh, I have a, I do a lot of academic writing. So for you, Re, I had to be like, where do I have some <laughs> non-academic 
not academic writing. Um, and so I actually have it posted on my website right now. So so this is all printed there if if anybody wants to go back to it. But I am going to read about 90% of it for you. Um, it's called Southern Baptist Sex Positivity. I'm a Baptist. Church people understand. Baptist born, Baptist bred. And when I die, I'll be Baptist dead. You know, I believe in deacons and church mothers, trustees and pastors aid committees, Baptist training, training union, if you know, you know. Sunday school, missionary Baptist, independent Baptist, Southern Black Baptists are a culture. Get into it. What I always noticed when I was deep in the church as a child is that for sex to be so taboo, it was often the topic of discussion. It was really strange to me that the way that we were not supposed to talk about sex, that it was wrong, bad, and abomination before marriage and all of these things, I definitely knew I wasn't supposed to do it, especially if I wanted to be married and get me a good man. But the trouble was that preachers talked about it all the time. No exaggeration. I remember hearing about the sin of premarital sex more than I even heard of the threat of hell. Um, the sermon could be about Moses crossing the Sea of Reeds, and we were going to go to at least two other places, that the wages of the sin is death, and that premarital sex is the major one. Death and being an abomination were frightening, and yet I was having sex at 14, because puberty, curiosity, sex drive, all of that trumps <laughs> people's interpretations of the text. So frankly, I was just afraid of getting pregnant. I was afraid of the shame, the public sin. I was afraid that there was a part of me that had come alive in these private explorations and a part of me I didn't quite know where to put or how to name. But that fear was deeper than what other people could see. I had been taught to fear my body, to fear touching myself, to fear looking at myself naked, to fear what I knew to be true from erotic experience, to fear the truths that my body had revealed, hell, to resent that I desired sexual interaction in the first place. Fast forward 20 years, and now I've done it all. Had all kinds of experience, sense of celibacy, been gay, been poly, dated again, been celibate, been gay again. And it was my autonomy that I realized I had learned. I also realized that embedded in these theological under understandings, that as a sexual being, I had another source. Autonomy. I first learned in the Baptist church that I am freestanding, functioning entity with all rights appertaining thereunto, in Sir Robert's rules of order, if you know, you know. The other things I learned was watching my mother, my aunts, and my grandmothers get dressed for church. They needed their bodies. You see, we need them to feel and to know, right? You got to know. You got to try the spirit by the spirit. You got to know when the Holy Ghost is speaking. We need them to show up and show out. We need them to shout and to experience God. We also need them to know the beauty that is sexual. Being a Southern Baptist taught me this. It taught me that abominations really only applied to girls and gays and that we were not playing by the same rules as the cishet boys. However, I knew God didn't feel that way. So I started to think about my body the way my mother took the time to put on her stockings on Sunday mornings. Strong and delicate, not fragile, but priceless. I started to move through the world the way I remember the chairman of our deacon boards always being resolute. I decided that what somebody told me about my rules had nothing to do with me and little by little, that part of myself I experienced sexually felt more and more alive, like a divinely created home. You know, the kind of divine creation that is made in the image of God's likeness and so immaculately God that it looks upon God's own creation and pride and says, this is good. The scripture that says, do you want to be made whole never came with a sexual exemption. This healing work doesn't happen without our bodies and it cannot happen without the fullness of our sexual selves. Good sex, sex from exploration, partner sex, consensual, healthy, safe sexual play, fun sex, cuffing season sex, merry sex. Sex is for everybody that desires it in all of its healthy ways. Sex is for Southern girls too. Leaving any piece of my body or my truth at the altar or heteropatriarchy is sin. 
and the wage of that sin is death. I want all parts of me. Each part is divine. I still believe holiness is right. And hear me, it must be whole. Ah, Shay. Yes, yes, yes. Please drop in the chat where we could find that so that we could read it each night before bed as a sacred prayer. I'm going to need that on repeat. Mm, so powerful. Thank you so much, sis. Um, wow. Yeah, I think it's a particular, just thinking about the geography of the Black South and the Black church in the South, it's a very particular upbringing. And I grew up in Georgia for the first half of my life. And so, so much of your description and narration of what it felt like to be in that space, how confusing it was. I appreciate you naming that confusion and naming how you arrived at your own clarity and autonomy as like a central part of that understanding. Mm. I'm so grateful for that, sis. And I want to uh, come to Blue for our final question before we open it up uh, for q and I'm wondering if you can speak more to, we've touched on it some, but how Reiki supports with intergenerational healing. Um, and I also want to invite if you want to read one more piece from your book that uh, might touch on some of that intergenerational healing work. Yeah, no, Ashe, Ashe, Ashe. Oof, Rev, thank you for that. Um, <clears throat> in every way, shape, or form, loving myself is revolutionary, okay? Self-love, self-care, knowing that we have the right to pause, right? Like, to take care of ourselves, body scanning, even learning how to be in my body, like we just talked about autonomy. For me, Reiki, learning about my energy, realizing a PTSD trauma response of disassociation was somewhere I lived for a very long time, and fight fight, flight, freeze, fawn, you know, those, I, I, I tend, until I found Reiki is not when I became embodied, like my spirit, because I'm so spiritual, I knew of goddess spirit my whole life, like I knew humans had it wrong, I have a clear cognizance that is a knowing that I'm so grateful for, because I would be dead if I didn't have that, and I knew it was the humans, I would, you know, I've been baptized three times, also gay, queer, and I would ask the ask them, yo, what's up? Like, why are you, why are you preaching the wrong pre like the word Jesus is about love, you know? And they'd be like crickets, crickets, crickets. I'm like, okay, cool. I wasn't even mad at them because I knew that they just had the wrong word. So back to your question about inter intergenerational trauma. I believe that for me, I heal myself seven generations above me, seven generations before me. And from my sacred work that I've done with, with shamans and with my native American church, teacher, the chief, and I've learned that the power of energy ripples through time. Time is a social contract, construct, okay? Time is not real. It is man-made for the farmers, right? Right? So we base it on how my, and just like decolonizing my mind, decolonizing energy, decolonizing all of it, because my body, obviously, you know, being Black, mixed race, Jamaican, Black, European, like literally colonized and colonizer, you know what I'm saying? Having that confusion, not being Black enough, not being white enough. So I had to come to the point where it's like, okay, I've got to find my way. And I knew for me, it was a higher power. It was spiritual. It had to be a, a spiritual understanding. And 12 Steps helped me understand that too, because I didn't get the clarity in the church. And, you know, I was touring a lot. I got signed really young. So I had a lot of like slight bits of fame. And then I had a nervous break down trying to heal my generational trauma on my own so I found therapists and you know I've done I've done a lot of work in that space and I believe that it's that radical I come back to the revolutionary being of love being able to learn how to love myself Reiki is everything with that like Reiki being able to body scan right and even learn about my energy centers okay the heart shock of my sick with my womb like if y'all don't know Queen of Four the womb my womb like the womb work okay so if I don't even have a relationship to know that I love my womb love my sacral chakra love my sacred sexuality self-love self self-healing self, -love, self, -love, self -love, 
You know what I'm saying? Self-satisfaction in every single way. Okay. And Reiki did that for me. Like Reiki was the, the, the way in, like the tunnel, the teachers allowing me to remove the blocks, getting everybody else's energy off of me, all my past lovers, all my mother, father, brother, sister, cousin, generational trauma I come from. I don't have a um, family of origin that I can gleam off of. I have soul family and I've created now with my wife and my son, breaking all that generational trauma. So I think that for me, being honest, and I'm going to share this thing called honestly from here, um, honesty, and also like the willingness to do the work and not have to save, you know, it's, it's a saying in the rooms, like not saving my face and my butt at the same time. I don't want to swear, but you know, like you can't save your butt and your face at the same time. So I got to be willing to look silly, willing to cry, willing to learn how to like not know it all. You know what I mean? To be wrong and to accept help. Like that that stuff of not being able to accept help. Like as Black women, as women in general, like we have a lot of problems accepting help. At least I'll speak for myself and my women that came before me. Too much pride in Boston and New York. Like all the pride in the world. Where it's like, now I will accept help. So this is honestly from Trauma Thrive. And it says, divine reality right here, right now. Divine higher power, clear my pain, honestly broken open. Gain clarity from the lies that poisoned my brain. Silenced in omission, choking, terrified to speak. I was terrified to feel, only identifying anger. Shut down from the pain, more will be revealed. Numbing my feelings, blurry vision. How do I know my feelings won't kill me? Asking my higher power to heal me, reveal me to me, my higher self. Upgrade the exhausted, traumatized human being, me. Honestly wanting a healthy way of life. Free me from self-deception the lies that taint my mind, free me from captivity, honestly give myself permission to be free, free to speak my mind, a prisoner of time, twisted perception, locked blindly inside, strip me of deception, the illusions that tainted my mind, the walking dead surrounded me, I honestly want to be alive, I want to choose better people, but I must first trans I must transform first inside the power of now, the power of honesty with oneself. There is only this moment. What is time? Living in divine reality, right here, right now. I call on the divine. I call on honesty. I will practice one day at a time, honestly accepting all of me in all places in all time. Honestly, and that to me is breaking all the generational curses and trauma and healing all the trauma by honestly being honest and saying, yo, this is my truth and I am radically accepting it and I'm radically willing to share it and accept help. By be me, be being that help, like that Lizzo Emmy speech. It gotta be me. If it ain't, ain't, I don't see it out there, it gotta be me. Yeah. That's how I feel, y'all. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Blue. Thank you so much, Esty. Um, I am still very new to Reiki. I've only had one Reiki session. But when I tell y'all, like, I was legitimately confused about what happened. I just felt so light when I walked out of it. Not like light, like light to dark, but like not heavy anymore. And I was like, I don't get what she just did. Cause I came in there, sis laid me down on her table. I had my eyes closed. I was feeling all calm and peaceful. I had my stuffed animals up there with me. And she just was, I mean, my eyes was closed, but I knew that like her hands was doing some things over my body. And then like 90 minutes later, I just felt so much lighter and I was having a lot of visualizations. I was having a lot of experiences internally, but what I went to Reiki for was around my own fear 
that I have very intense fear because of growing up in the black church that told me about hell and evil and demons and all of these really scary things for a child. So like my inner child's like, and my adult self still carrying a lot of that intense fear and shadow energy. And that to this day still makes it very hard to be with my spiritual gifts of clear audience of connecting with ancestors because all of that fear like blocks me from being in my gifts in ways that feel safe and comfortable for me but i say all this to say when i got that reiki done on me i walked out of there and she told me this and i was like i don't really believe her but then i felt that she was like we cleared a layer of that fear today she was like so many layers of fear that you have But like we clear one layer and I really did feel that like I still experience fear, but not in the way that I did before that session. And so for folks who are unfamiliar with Reiki or have never experienced it before, I share that as someone who is still new to it, but it helped me a lot with like releasing the intense energy of fear that I've been carrying since my childhood. And I don't believe it's a one and done. I don't think no one thing is going to heal us. I don't believe that we'll ever be done healing. I think every day that we hear on this earth, like our healing is a lifelong journey. And also we can graduate and move forward and grow. Right. But I feel like Reiki has been, um, even though I've only experienced it one time, like it's it's one of many important healing tools and healing modalities for me, but it's the healing modality that uh, has been really transformative. So I'm just so honored to be able to kind of share the gift of this medicine with folks and just want to open it up now for uh questions if so, i could jump yeah. in I, uh-huh. I, just, I just don't want to forget so two things um i'm gonna start with what you were saying um is that um that's part of the power of energetic modality modalities like reiki is that you can um work with a particular expected in a particular expected outcome and so those things can be emotional they can be energetic um, now, of course, your practitioner will be able to know that, okay, some of these things are overlapping and I need to use some integrated methods, but that's 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 their, that's what they're there for. Um, but I think this ties in, um, and I certainly had the same first time experience. That's what I was saying earlier. I was like, wait, what did you just, I don't know. I was feeling all kind of right. So I think that's a very normal way to respond, especially for a person who's, who can be a spiritual sensitive. So if you don't respond that way, it doesn't mean that it's wrong. Um, but uh, Blue said something that I wanted to comment on as well that made me think about the the class is also Reiki is a very good um, modality to be used alongside Western medicine, particularly like I do work around wound work, thinking about fertility, hormonal balance, um, being able to clear some of those um, energetic and physical issues. Also with people who may have chronic disease um, with when it comes to pain. Um, Reiki is a very effective tool of being able to do pain management and also um, using some of the energetic tools to clear away some of the root energetic and spiritual causes for how the body is carrying this ease, um, which is its own type of, you know, um, ritual science. Um, so I just wanted to offer that offer that piece to the conversation. Shay. Thank you so much, Esty. I appreciate that context as well. And yes, uh, like speaking to the purpose of this class, us talking about medicine and these radical, integrative, um, holistic approaches to medicine, just honoring and affirming that Reiki is a medicinal tool, right, that we can use uh, for our holistic well-being. So please go ahead and raise your hand if you have any questions and we will take one round of questions and then invite our panelists to give some closing comments and reflections and responses to y'all's questions. So feel free to raise your hand. 
Brit, I see you. I'm wondering, you know, okay, look, Brit said, uh-uh. I just was looking right at you because I was like, she about to ask something. Okay, boo, all good. <laughs> Anyone have any questions for our panelists or comments or reflections? I see the chat been blowing up. Okay, let me see. Just wondering, how do we explore further? Thank you, Ife. Can you clarify, like, explore what yeah. further? Uh -huh. Yeah, like, how do we, um, I mean, I live in San Francisco, and, you know, no tea, no shade, but anybody can roll up and call themselves a Reiki healer. And I'm thinking, if racism is not incorporated into your Reiki healing, I don't know what we're healing. Um, and there's all these barriers such as cost and sort of thinking about who you're going to go to. And it's like, is the healing accessible to the people who need it the most? Or are we out here trying to heal elite people who can afford it, right? And so what does it look like? How do you sort of think through who you're working with? Um, is Reiki something that you do in person? Is there Reiki healing virtually? Um, what are things that you would recommend in vetting people to work with? Um, I've been thinking about like ancestral healing and energy healing and just kind of like a lot of what you all shared resonates with me and I just don't know where to begin, honestly. Thank you so much, Ife, for your question. I'm seeing some similar questions in the chat. Um, Smiley saying, how can you tell the right Reiki person? I hella resonate. Um, where do you suggest people find Reiki uh oh, sorry, sis, I lost your question. Ashi is saying, where do you suggest people find Reiki practitioners to study from? Um, okay, ATL, we see you in the building. Um, yeah, I think those are the main questions. And oh, okay, here's another one. Are there any suggestions for exploring Reiki and general healing while managing finances? Um because I'm starting to find that some aspects are not accessible without the proper funds. Thank you, Jordan. Um, yes, 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 all of that. So I hella resonate with these questions. As much as I had a really beautiful Reiki experience the first time, I actually had a really triggering and somewhat traumatizing experience the second time because I realized that the Reiki practitioner was not asking critical questions <laughs> about uh, class, race, uh, gender, right? Like how do we have these spiritual healing modalities that also can name the harms that are structural and systemic? Um, I think there's ways that sometimes spiritual conversations can turn into the energy that you attract is the only uh, way that we can understand why quote unquote bad things happen to good people, right? And so how do we have conversations about energy that also names <laughs> structural and systemic violence as a part of the energies that have been forced upon us without our consent. Um, so that, that was a very harmful experience. I'm still looking for, if y'all know anybody who is out here, Black women doing Reiki in the Bay Area, please let me know. I'm still searching. Um, and particularly that have radical and critical politics with the way that they're engaging their uh, spiritual practice. So anyway, I just say all that to say, I hella resonate with these questions and thank y'all. And I'm going to turn it over to our panelists to please respond to these questions and offer any uh, final comments that y'all might have for our folks before we close. And I know those were a lot of questions and I'm gonna ask if we could keep it to maybe like three minutes each so that we could get to our class. <laughs> so final comments and responses to the questions and then we'll have a uh, Reverend Esty close us out after our survey. Okay, well, I'll respond because Essie's going to bless us and close us out. Um, well, thank you for all that. And, you know, we can do virtual as well. You know, there's a beautiful book, Diane Stein. It's the Essential Reiki. And um, one of my teachers used this book. And it's it was remembered again. It's there, There's a lot of stuff. It's energy. So it's timeless. I'm in Los Angeles. Uh, in, in person healings. And I'm sorry what happened, Ree. That's, that's yes. 
it's all about that. It's ancestral. That's why finding a person of color or another black woman is, for me, I, I, it's like, it's a dream, right? But sometimes it's not um, available. So we can do virtual if you can't do, you know what I'm saying, in person. And I just, I think that the willingness to want to recover and want to heal your body, like let's start virtual. You know what I'm saying? Essie's in Atlanta. I'm in Los Angeles. And I, I'm sorry, Ree, I just hate that. And everything happens for a reason, you know what I'm saying? And everything in life, we're all in this room for a reason. And Reiki is something that um, I'm I'm so grateful that I'm be able to just be a conduit and a channel of divine universal light, okay? Divine healing light. And we can do that from anywhere in the room. So I, my email's in there. Y'all can email me that we can get dive deeper. Even I'll give y'all some, and I also wanted to give you a Reiki healing workbook, but I wasn't able to put it in the chat. So maybe Re can email it to y'all after, or you can email me and I'll send it out personally and yeah for number one it's that becoming in your body right and being just that self-scan if y'all didn't take anything away from what I do like learn to own your body temple be in your body temple love your body temple that is a temple to your beautiful spirit that is limitless okay and that healing energy that is within us that yes I've been initiated and attuned in many symbols and many many ceremonial, it's a ceremony, it's sacred, you know, and that's how each of my Reiki sessions is as well. But it's also virtual where y'all say, I sent you, I'm still sending y'all healing, loving light if you're willing to say yes and receive. So it's something that is just timeless. So my email is in there, my website is in there. Um, the questions, honestly, I'm I'm getting flooded with way too many intuitive things on all of this. So I'm a little overwhelmed <laughs> with all of the structure. So that's what I got to say. And I would love to connect with anybody who wants to have a consult with me if you're ready to heal and deal with your life in a way that this, yes, this aligns with Western medicine. And this is ancient wisdoms of today, okay? Y'all, this is beautiful. So good luck to y'all. And I'm Blue Nile, and I'm so happy that I got to meet y'all. Hands it over to Esty. Okay, I'm gonna respond to the questions. Um, and then we do a survey, Dr. Reed. Is that right? Okay. Yeah, uh, and then we're after our survey, Reverend okay. Esty gonna close us out in a prayer. All right. <laughs> so um around practitioners, I wanna say two things. First, I think a really great way to to vet folks is just to ask them the question. Hey, what are your elders' names? Where did you study? Um under whom did you study, right? So you kind of want to be careful about folks that say, oh, I taught myself, right? Um, because these are not modalities that quite work that way. Um, um, not that um, there are not useful ways that our spirits communicate with us. It's not to knock any of that. Um, I'm certainly an uh, empath and a medium and all of those great things. So I, I live my life that way. However, um, that's a good way to kind of know what a person's um, regimen um, and curriculum would have looked like. And, and I think even better if they can kind of, like Blue and I got into a whole side conversation when we first met the other night talking about our elders, right? So like I can list call on the phone right now, right? You know what I mean? But when you have those relationships, um, as, as Dr. Reese said, we're always growing in this healing. So we continue to study, which means our elders are continuing to study. Um, and so there, there's a continued relationship in some way, right? Now that can look many different ways. So I think that's a great question to ask. I think that's a great place to start. I think another um, thing to consider is virtual, but also the, the second thing I'm gonna say to y'all for real is I want us to get in our bodies. So to trust your gut. What is your gut telling you? Not your head, not what are you thinking, not does this person seem cute? Does this, and I, and I, and I don't mean cute as in sexual, I mean cute as in like they seem like they're doing the things that I think Ricky people supposed to do, right? Like they got sage burners, child, you can get it at the Walmart now. It's on Amazon, right? Like, so look for what your gut, what your spirit, what your body is telling you. And, and all of us can be great, right? We're both excellent practitioners. You may be drawn to one or the other. That is, ain't nothing wrong with that because your spirit knows the the way, the medicine in which it needs to be guided. Um, and we're all in the work. We just all want to be well. So I say, trust your body, listen to your gut. I think this question about finances is tricky, right? Because this is how I pay this high gas bill at my house, right? <laughs> so like, there's a very realistic way that we're all 
you know, fighting the power and fighting the system, but we're also all living in the system. I know I personally allow people to do payment plans, sliding scale. Like I, I, I'm happy to work with folks because I want you to get the work done. Um, but also there's a way that I have to honor myself. Um, so I think be willing um, to find a person that you can be vulnerable with and tell them whatever it is. And I know I'm certainly a person and the folks that I have learned from and the folks that I work alongside are people that that find ways, you know, I have bartered for services happily, you know what I'm saying? So I think that there are ways that we can be in community and get what we need. That was my three minutes. I say thank you so much. And I also just want to name that the, um, Amy, I'm hoping you can drop this in the chat for us. The Freedom, I think it's called the Freedom Clinic um, in the Bay Area. They offer uh, free and low cost healing services to folks in the community. Um, and they have Reiki practitioners. So Amy, I'm sorry to put you on the spot, but if you could please uh, put the information for that in the chat, that would be wonderful. Just so folks who are wondering about accessibility can tap in. Um, and I'm, I mean, Amy, oh, there we go. Thank you so much, Amy. Freedom Community Clinic is the name of it. And Amy just put it in the chat. So if y'all are looking for free and low cost Reiki in the Bay Area, Freedom Community Clinic um, is a great place to check out. Thank y'all so much. I'm just feeling so full and so grateful from this conversation. For those of y'all who have been rocking with us for this whole teaching series, y'all know what time it is. It's time for our survey. So our survey is the time where we can shower our panelists with gratitude, where we can thank them, where we can let them know what's resonating with us and send them some love and send back back to them the light and love energy that they have blessed us with. So I'm going to go ahead and drop that survey link in the chat for y'all. And while we fill out this survey, I'm also so excited to play one of Blue's many powerful songs on Spotify. So here goes our survey link right there. And we'll take about three or so minutes to fill out that survey while we are rocking to I Am by Blue. I accept myself as 